Hello, folks. <laughs> Thank you for joining me. Uh, it's kind of funny that uh, I was just smacking on uh, that show, Ancient Aliens, and their experts. Uh, and I think in the last video, or maybe it was in the first part. I don't remember. It was in the first or second. Ow, damn, Nick. Uh, or first or second part of this uh, series. But I did make a comment regarding it. And uh, tonight's episode... On, it's on History Channel 2. A lot of people may not get History Channel 2. Uh, it's different from the regular History Channel. Um, it's on Friday nights. And I was watching it. And um, I'll be dang if they didn't go through. You know, I thought they were doing pretty good tonight. Doing uh, the space exploration program. Talking about the lunar landings the uh, Masonic influence of the people behind the Apollo program including uh, the astronauts and there's how they may have performed the secret ceremonies of the Masons and in fact it went into detail that they did and um, then it went even further uh, amazingly I mean it went into the secret societies behind the uh, formation in 1958 of uh, NASA it went on to uh, link their knowledge and their belief systems to the ancient Egypt and Osiris and Isis and uh, the Orion Belt and, and Sirius of course and um, the whole connection I mean they were just doom boom 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 bam and then it even went further to trace their origins down to uh, back you know through time the secret societies to the Illuminati and uh, Aleister Crowley and uh, made all kinds of connections and and then also right now that's actually still on I just turned it down so I can get this done uh, to Werner Braun, von Braun uh, the Nazi scientists behind NASA and all this stuff they're talking about oh, quite openly uh, right here on the History Channel too. Uh, I was I was like, whoa, my gosh, have we made gigantic steps? Okay, so for all the all the people that want to smack on uh, uh, conspiracy theories and theorists, you know, here we've been reviewing this stuff. I have videos on my Mind Crime channel from a year, or two years ago, uh, reviewing the STS space shuttle. UFO films and, and other things um, of the like you know I've been trying to tell people for years and they're like oh you know and they of course you know you know their rhetoric they make fun of us and people laugh and, and that's why the public's not privy to the information because they can't handle it uh, they wouldn't believe half of it if you you know sh shoved it in their face anyway so that's why there are secret societies for the people that can handle this type of information that uh, we have tried to reveal to the public. Well, now they're just blabbering it all over the TV. It's like, bam, this is it, you know. It's, it's amazing. I'm sitting here just flabbergasted at this episode of Ancient Aliens. So, I mean, you can probably look it up online if you missed it on TV. Uh, this particular episode, I don't know the number of the episode, but you know, tonight's date is March 1st, 2013. And it's an extraordinary, I have to give them props, it's an extraordinary episode of Ancient Aliens. Probably the best episode they have ever done. It's amazing. So, uh, with that, <laughs> I'm just like flabbergasted. It's, it's, it's pretty wild. So, cool. Anyway, uh, that just shows that they're that much closer to actual exposure, uh, or I say disclosure, I should say disclosure. Um, I got a message and I got to an answer here real quick, sorry for the delay. But, um. So we're going to carry on with uh, part three. Um, and 
I'm going to plug it out real quick tonight, get it posted up tonight, even though i got to try to get to bed a little early tonight because i got to head out in the morning for a 1,200-mile drive. It takes me, I've made the trip a couple times already, dealing with the recent attack from events that span from 10 years back, and all of a sudden the government decides they want me now. And um, so I've been having to deal with this situation in my life. And uh, it's it's a 17 and a half to 18 hour drive. Depending on how many times I stop, of course. And so uh, we're going to knock this out real quick. Uh, we Where we left off here. If I can find my information, I want to I want to get it done because I want to close all these windows. It's been open for three days now uh, since I started doing this stuff, um, this particular subject. And you know, again, I recommend you start at the beginning. You know, if you're just tripping upon this, this is part three. Please start with part one, and that way I don't have to listen to like comment I received you know in part two about any bias or anything which was just didn't make sense at all that was the whole point of how I started off part two was to explain the reasons why I picked this particular God and this particular religion um, and it wasn't because I I approve or like the religion I do not agree with Christianity okay I know what the churches are. They've been the same from the very beginning of what they are today. Okay? And as far as even Christ knew, see, people need to actually pick up the dang book and read it for themselves and see what Christ had to say for himself, himself and quit listening to the damn guy on the pulpits. And it doesn't matter what church you're talking about. I think I made that quite clear in this last one, talking about Jehovah's Witness. It, I, made it, I made the comment... Uh, it's just one of the cults. They're all cults. I said that plainly as day. All churches are cults. Okay, Christ wasn't walking. It wasn't here uh, to start a church. <laughs> that's not what he came here for, and that's not what he was teaching, and that's not what he says. And in fact, he was against the church, as it were, and uh, he was trying to tell you the truth of the relationship between the Father and creation. And uh, the churches had took that and twisted that message into oblivion and mixed it with their gods. And uh, But anyway, again, I, didn't, I wasn't making these videos to really get into all that subject matter and discussion. This is simply uh, trying to point to the name game. And tonight we're going to cover uh, mainly Jesus and his names and the twisting of his names, the histories of his names, the interpretations, transliterations, etc. of the name, period. Uh, the reason for this, because the name game being played, a lot of one of the main ones, of course, is his relationship or in his name, Jesus, as we know it, which is through the Greek. I know before I might have slipped up and said it was through the Latin, but either way, um, what what we get today out of English is always through the Latin, even if it originated in Greek or Hebrew or Aramaic, um, just through the transliteration of it all, the translations into our what we call modern English, which is the modern version of the Queen's English which was given to us and it is a very limited language if you study other religions such as Eastern religions and the Tao and stuff like that um, you can see that our language uh, you know immediately uh, leaves words out that are descriptive words for certain aspects and, and, and uh, concepts in life and creation um, in fact they create in our language words to nullify those concepts uh, and those realities uh, by calling you know them everything from hallucinations 
to you know they, they create a whole plethora of words to write it off in our language instead of explaining it they just want to write it off you know if you talk about these things if you uh, experience these things in your life ah uh, well you're just you're you're paranoid or you're hallucinating or you're you know some type of condition that they've created up to explain uh, your experience which just uh, doesn't confirm the experience at all it it uh, you know that it redirects you because they don't it's a it's a limited language and it's used for limiting means uh, upon the public the general public so with that said and uh, you know, the, the comment was something about me being biased because I'm Christian, blah, 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 blah. Which actually, nowadays, I, you know, I actually take offense to that. Okay. Um, I understand some people just aren't really up to date. Um, maybe it's their first time coming. Maybe it's, they're not really into researching. Maybe they're not really into the, to the, uh, experience of life as it were and they're more traditional Americans which are brainwashed and uh, confused and deceived in many ways and distracted um, I myself have never been that way since childhood um, I have been on a spiritual journey my whole life I never sold to the world I didn't worry about career money uh, all these things that most people grow up to worry about. I didn't go through the indoctrination centers and uh, get the programming like most American kids. I was actually brought up, uh, <coughs> excuse me, in a religious atmosphere um, as a youngster from a very young age and preschool age and stuff. Everything I learned was I was taught by nuns, by Catholic nuns. Uh, everything from how to read, write, my ABCs, arithmetic to how to swim. Um, everything I know from youth was taught to me by Catholic nuns. I went on to Episcopal schools. I actually, at the age of like seven to eight years old, my parents weren't religious. <laughs> and I would take myself to church. I actually would go, uh, we had a church about a mile and a quarter away from where we lived. It was a big old old fashioned church. And I used to take myself there to Sunday school and stuff by myself. I went by myself on my own accord as a youngster. I've had a different kind of life. And I went on, actually, when I got into uh, my older years and rebelled against the system because I could see everybody was full of shit and everybody was lying to me, even as a youngster. Um, so I turned to, of course, the anger, the emotions, the human process. I turned rebel and uh, was a lawbreaker and uh, considered juvenile delinquent and all that made ward of the state and uh, went through foster homes treatment centers um, I had nine felony counts on my record before I ever turned 15 years old actually before I was 13 years old I had nine felony counts already um, and that's just my juvenile record <laughs> I'm not even going to get into the rest of my life, but I went to the dark side for a while, dabbled into black magic, dabbled into, uh, you know, Satanism a little bit, not really Satanism as in worship of Satanism, but the black side, the occult, uh, through my teenage years and stuff, and um, I had a series of, exper of experiences, and especially later on in my life, in my uh, 20s, uh, early in, early 20s and mid 20s, I had uh, many experiences, and in 94, it's my mind crime channel is mind crime 1994, no it's not my birth date, that was actually in 93 and 94, I went through a, about an 8, 9 month period of what I call my soul quest, and uh, that's where I had been, uh, I'd been already been working for the company for a while, in, in the drug cartel game, and um, I was actually offered, I was taken, I was, I, I can't even say taken because when it, come, when it happens, it comes to you. Uh, literally, it comes to you. Uh, but I've been to the crossroads. I've 
I've been offered the chance to sell my soul for material and worldly gain and I turned the devil down and um, I've had a plethora of supernatural experiences in my life I have seen everything in this so-called reality that we think most people think is the material world I knew about energy and quantum and all that uh, concepts and the holographic reality that we live in uh, since that time since the, those experiences way back then and that was my true awakening I mean I was I was awake to the world before then to the lies and to the deceptions of our government and the crookedness of everything uh, through the drug game and through working with the company and, and other things but I had my true spiritual awakening in that period 93 to 94 and it carried on um, and I, I, I've just I've had experiences way beyond your average human experience and uh, I've met demons I've had demons I've face to face real live in your face material demons not just some imaginary in your head or anything like that I'm talking real stuff here um, so please spare me with any negative comments that you may think you have because of your ego of what you think you may think you know because I'm here to tell you now you don't know squat you don't know Jack Diddley shit okay um, I have experienced everything I have experienced and I am still only willing to say I know enough to know that I know nothing okay so with that said let us move on the names of God we'll start with this page for the heck of it and I, I went through this other page here yesterday uh, on part two with the names of God in Judaism and uh, we went through those various names here we're gonna just briefly go through the names of God period um, in this uh, article about the names for the monotheist notion of a singular God for theonyms generally see list of deities okay so this is the names of God under monotheism okay for our holy names described form of addressing God present liturgy or prayer of various world religions prayer involving the holy name or the name of God has become a part of both Western and Eastern spiritual practices a number of traditions have lists of many names of God many of which enumerate the various qualities of the supreme being the English word God is used by multiple religions as a noun or name to refer to different deities ancient cognate equivalents for the word God include pro-semitic El Hebrew Elohim which means God or of gods Arabic Ilah or which means a or the God uh, the biblical Aramaic Ilaha God a uh, personal or proper name for God in many of these languages may either be distinguished from such attributes or homonic, uh, homonymic or for example Judaism the holy name is sometimes related to the ancient Hebrew Ihye I will be or in Hinduism the term Brahma or Parabrahma is often used or is also symbolized by the word Om pronounced Om <laughs> while in other cases the proper name for a deity is given a special significance as a true name of God or incorporated from earlier beliefs as in the case of the Native American appellation Gichumantu and correlation between the various theories and interpretations of the name of God used to signify a monotheistic or ultimate supreme being from which all other divine attributes derive has been a subject of ecumenical, ecumenical, yeah, I hate that word, ecumenical, ecum, yeah, you know what it was, ecumenical, I always pronounce, I get the N and the N backwards, but anyway, <laughs> ecumenical uh, discourse between Eastern and Western scholars for over two centuries. 
In Christian theology, the word must be a personal and proper name of God, hence it cannot be dismissed as a mere metaphor. On the other hand, the names of God in different traditions are sometimes referred to by symbols. The question whether divine names used by different religions are equivalent has been raised and analyzed. See also taboos below. Exchange of names held sacred between different religions, traditions is uh, religious traditions is typically limited. Other elements of religious practice may be shared, especially when communities of different faiths are living in close proximity. For example, the use of Om and Gayatri, or Gayatri within the Indian Christian community. But usage of the names themselves mostly remain within the domain of a particular region, or even may help define one's religious belief according to practice, as in the case of the recitation of names of God, such as Jaffa. Now, the divine names in the classic treatise by Pseudo Dionysius uh, defines the scope of traditional understandings in Western traditions such as Hellenic, Christian, Jewish, and Islamic theology on the nature and significance of the names of God. Further historical lists such as the 72 names of the Lord show parallels in the history and interpretation of the name of God amongst Kabbalah, Christianity, and Hebrew scholarship in various parts of the Mediterranean world. One definition of the name of God was given by Elisha Mulford as, and I quote, that name which passes into the common forms of thought, end quote. The author states that in its derivation, it may have an ethical significance. Other writers suggest that the name of God presents the nature of God, and the attitude as to the transmission of the name in many cultures was surrounded by secrecy. In Judaism, the pronunciation of the name of God has always been guarded with great care. It is believed that in ancient times the sages communicated the pronunciation only once every seven years. This system was challenged by more recent movements. The nature of the holy name can be described as either personal or attributive. In many cultures, it is often difficult to distinguish between the personal and attributive names of God, the two divisions necessarily shading into each other. This over here on the side that we're looking at here, and uh, let's see if we can get a bigger picture of it for the heck of it. There we go. Kircher. This is the Kircher diagram. It's Anatheus and the Theosis uh, Kircher's diagram of the names of God. And uh, we actually kind of touched on this in Manly P. Hall's Secret Teachings of All Ages. I think he kind of went over this. Of course, you recognize the symbol in between here is the symbol of the Jesuits. Um, we have all kinds of names that go around this whole wheel here. And uh, the names of God in the o Oedipus Agapitaceus. Ag I, I really can't pronounce that word. It's from the 17th century. It's a book... Um, and it was written by uh, Athanasius Kircher. Um, so, and, and we're not getting into that real deep, but there, I mean, you can see here, <laughs> how many names? Look at all these names. I mean, seriously. And it starts from the beginning, goes out, it goes into uh, from Hebrew to Greek to Latin, etc. Um, okay. And uh, if you want to find this page for yourself and look at some of this stuff yourself, it's, uh, you know, Wikipedia, uh, Names of God. Uh, the Ara uh, Ara Aramic religions, according to the Bible, the name of God was used during the lifetime of Adam and Eve. But by the time Moses was born, the scriptures implied that none of mankind still knew the name, which is what I've said through every edition of this series. In the book of Exodus, God commands Moses to tell the people that I am sent him. And this is revered as one of the most important names of God according to Mosaic tradition. When then Moses said to God, and I'm quoting Exodus 3, 13 to 15 here. Then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? 
what shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel. And then it shows the tetrahedron, or tetrahedron, I mean the tetragrammaton, sorry. And the uh, YH, WH, possibly the one who is and will be. And the third person from I am, i.e. the one who is, has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. And thus far he has been, hasn't he? <laughs> uh, uh, according to Islam, the earliest mention of the name of God is found in the Quran, Surah. Two, uh, the cow, uh, when, and I quote, When your Lord said to the angels, I am placing on the earth one that shall rule as my deputy, they replied, Will you put there one that will do evil and shed blood when we have for so long sung your praises and sanctified your name? End quote. In Exodus 6.3, when Moses first spoke with God, God said, I used to and I quote again, I used to appear to Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, and Japheth as El Shaddai. But I did not make myself known to them by my name. And it shows the tetragrammaton. Of course, we pronounce it as Yahweh in that particular spelling in our English transliteration of translation. When Moses heard the name of God, he realized that since he had a speech impediment as a result of what he had called uncircumcised lips, uh, 6.12, he was unable to pronounce it accurately. Okay. The Torah further describes the role of Aaron, who acted as Moses' mouthpiece, and conveyed the name of God distinctly to the Israelites, transcribed as Yahweh in the he Biblical Hebrew, and conveyed the name of God distinctly as Yahweh to the Israelites. The pronunciation of Yahweh is described in Psalms 8.2 by the prophet who wrote, Thou hast made babes, infants at the breast sound, aloud thy praise. Several thousands of years later, commentaries, that was the, okay. Thou hast made babes, infants at the breast, sound, aloud thy praise. That is how you pronounce his name. <laughs> uh, think on that one for a minute, huh? Huh? Okay, several thousands of years later, commentary has additionally suggested that the true pronunciation of his name is composed entirely of vowels, such as the Greek uh, leo, or leov, however, that, however you say that in Greek, as they allow the creation of language, thus conveying the absolute infinite potential of God's character. However, this is put into question by the fact that vowels were only distinguished in the time period by their very absence due to the lack of explicit vowels in the Hebrew script. The resulting substitute made from semi-vowels and glottals, uh, known as the Tetragrammaton, is considered the proper name of God in Judaism and is not ordinarily permitted to pronounce it aloud even in prayer. The prohibition on misuse, not use, of this name is the primary subject of the command not to take the Lord, name of the Lord in vain. See also taboos below. The Baha'i faith, the Baha'i scriptures, uh, often refer to God by various titles and attributes such as Almighty, All-Powerful, All-Wise, Incomparable, um, Gracious, Helper, All-Glorious, and Omniscient. Um, Baha'is belief in uh, believe the greatest of all names of God is all glorious or Baha in Arabic. Baha is the root word of the following names and phrases. The greeting Allah u Baha or Abba uh, Allah u Abba God is the all glorious. The invocation Ya Baha u Abba which is O thou glory of the most glorious, or Baha'u'llah, -la and the glory of God, and Baha'i, follower of the all glorious. These are expressed in Arabic regardless of the language in use. See Baha'i symbols.
Apart from these names, God is addressed in the logical language, or I mean, sorry, local language. For example, Ishwar in Hindi, uh, Dux in French, and Dios in Spanish. Baha'is believe the Baha'u'llah, Baha the founder of Baha'is faith, is complete incarnation of the names and attributes of God. Christianity names God and Christianity in the holy name of Jesus. The authors of the New Testament took for granted the existence of the God of the Old Testament. They believed in Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and whom the Jews worshipped as the one true God. The New Testament teaches that there is only one God, who is pure spirit, the creator of the world, holy and good, all-powerful, follow oh, and worthy of humanity's worship and love. Uh, English translations of the New Testament render hothios, or othios in Greek, as God, and hokurios, and we've already covered the kurios, or okupiak, as the Lord. Uh, following Christian New Testament, God is referred to in slightly abbreviated form as the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, literally and figuratively. Another title of God is Hoan, okay, as in Greek, Hoan, often depicted in Orthodox iconography, literally meaning he who is or he who exists, but usually translated as the living God or I am that I am. Regarding the Old Testament, the Israelite theonyms Elohim and Yahweh are mostly rendered as God and the Lord, respectively. Although in the Protestant tradition, the personal names Yahweh and Jehovah, play, based on the Tetragrammaton, are also used. Jehovah appears in Tyndale's Bible and the King James Version and other translations from that time period and later. Many translations of the Bible translate the Tetragrammaton as Lord following the Jewish practice of substituting the spoken Hebrew word Adonai, translated as Lord, for Yahweh when read aloud. Almost all Orthodox Jews avoid using either Yahweh or Jehovah altogether on the basis that the actual pronunciation of the Tetragrammaton has been lost in antiquity. Many use the term Hashim, meaning the name, as a euphorism, or they use God or the Lord instead. Now Jesus, or Isus, Yeshua, Joshua, Yahshua, or Yahushua, Arabic Yasu, is a Hebraic personal name meaning Yahweh saves, helps, and salvation. Christ means the anointed in Greek. The Greek exphorectak, or Christos, is the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew word Messiah. Arabic al masha or al masi not sure how that's pronounced, but al masi While in English, the old Anglo-Saxon Messiah, rendering uh, Highland healer, was practically annihilated by the Latin Christ, uh, some cognate or co cognates such as Heland in Dutch and uh, Africans survive. Also in German, the word Heland is sometimes used as reference to Jesus in church chorals. Now, in Messian Messianic Judaism, generally regarded as a form of Christianity, Yahweh, pre-incarnate, and Yeshua, incarnate, are the one and the same. And the second person, with the Father and the, the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, being the first and third persons, respectively. The Ha Elohim, the Godhead. Yahweh is expressed as Hashim, which means the name. Some Quakers often refer to God as the light. Another term is King of Kings, or Lord of Lords, Lord of the Hosts. Other names used by Christians include, include Ancient of Days, Father, and Abba. Most High, and the Hebrew names Elohim, El Shaddai, and Adonai. The name Abba, Father, is the most common term used for the Creator within Christianity because it was the name Jesus Christ, Yeshua or HaMashiach, or Yeshua, the Messiah, himself used to refer to God. 
Jehovah's Witnesses use the name Jehovah for God the Father, as this is commonly used rendition of the personal name Yahweh in Hebrew that God has revealed to humans through his written word in the Holy Bible. Psalms 83 to 18, Exodus 6 3, Isaiah 12, uh, 12 2 and 26 4, and the King James Version. Um, in Mormonism, fathers, I just got another message, that's right, stumbled over my tongue there. Okay. So, hold on a second. Um, oh, all right. In Mormonism, the Father's God's name is Elohim. And Jesus' name in his pre incarnate state was Jehovah. The Book of Mormon ends with To meet you before the pleasing bar of the great Jehovah, the eternal judge of both the quick and the dead. Amen. Moroni. Scroll this up a little bit here. In the movement, uh, Emia Slave, name glorification, opposed by the Russian Orthodox Church, the name of God is God Himself and can be used to invoke miracles. Shangdi, or Shangdi, Shangdi, literally King Above, is, or Shangdi, uh, King above is also used to refer to the Christian God in the standard Chinese Union version of the of the Bible. Korean Catholics and Korean Angelicans use the cognate of his name, Sangyi or Sangyi, which has uh, largely fallen out of regular use in favor of the term Chongjai or Chongju. I'm not sure. Chongju or Tianzu. Tian Hu. I, I'm not sure how to pronounce that. I'm not Korean. <laughs> Listed below is the usage was applicable, only not uh, not using the vernacular Hanium or Haninum. Uh, Haninum. See, I can't even pronounce that. Wow. Haninum. 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 There you go. Which was the traditional Korean name for the mythology, uh, mythological god of heaven, a primary but not the only Korean mythological deity. Liberal minded Korean Protestants also used Hananium or Haninunum. Haninunum. Well, I, I better pronounce my uh, uh, Asian uh, pronunciations, huh? Uh, but not Sangji. And uh, conservative, conservative, <laughs> I trip over my tongue on this stuff. Okay, conservative Korean Protestants do not use Sangji or Hanium or Haninium, whatever, at all, but instead use Haninum. Now I can pronounce that Haninum, which implied the oneness of the Almighty, distinct from the mythological implications they see in the term, in the other term, Haninium. Haninum, and uh, many Vietnamese Christians also use uh, cognates of this name, expected to have a distribution and usage similar to the Korean Christians, with Angelicans and Catholics using Sanji in ritual ceremonial context, and Protestants not using it at all to refer to the biblical God. Shin, God, Spirit, or Deity, was adopted by Protestant missionaries in China to refer to the Christian God. In this context, it is usually rendered with a space to demonstrate reverence. Zhu, or Zahu, Tian Zuhu, uh, Lord or Lord in Heaven, is translated from the English word Lord, which is a formal title of the Christian God in mainland China's Christian churches. Korean Catholics also use the Korean cognate of this term, Tian Zhu, uh, as or it might just be a silent C, it might be Hyeonju, Hanju, as a primary reference to God in both ritual ceremony and vernacular, but mostly via ritual ceremonial context. Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of Pennsylvania believe that God has only one name, Jehovah, and that he has many attributes such as love, wisdom, justice, power, um, 
which he uses to guide, defend, or care for his people in such cases it may become necessary for him to take on various roles, creator, father, sovereign, lord, shepherd, hearer of prayer, judge, grand instructor, repurchaser, savior, avenger, counselor, etc. In the case of Pharaoh, he was about to prove himself by taking up his role as deliverer. When he destroyed Pharaoh and his hosts, he proved to be Jehovah of armies. Some of God's servants credited his deeds. For instance, Abraham found a ram caught in a thicket and subsequently offered it instead of Isaac. Abraham uh, viewed this ram as Jehovah's provision and therefore named the place Jehovah Jeri. And, uh, or back then it would have been Jehovah Jeri. Moses built an altar and named it Jehovah Nissi on account of God's promise to annihilate the Amalekites, Amalekites, I'm sorry, Amalekites, and uh, these roles are often mistakenly referred to as the names of God, when really they are simply titles. Uh, see Psalms 83:18. Jesus too took on various roles to accomplish his work while on earth. Okay, and Islam, Allah, is the most frequently used name of God in Islam. It is an Arabic word meaning the God. Besides these Arabic names, Muslims of non-Arab origins may also sometimes use other names in their own languages to God, such as Koda in Persian language, or the Ottoman in anchor, anchor, anachronism Tanri, originally pre-Islamic Tingarianists, Turks, celestial chief god, corresponding to the ancient Turkic god Tengri. The use of the word God in English is also seen as acceptable to Muslims. The term is used throughout the Quran in passages detailing the existence of God and of the beliefs of non-Muslims and other divinities. Uh, notably, the first statement of Shahada is, is that, uh, and I quote, there is no deity but Allah, there is no God but Allah, the Almighty God, which cancels out the possibility of other gods as it uses the referring to one. Sufism, Sufism who or Huwa, the Pervertigar, are used as named of God. Huwa. Judaism. Uh, gods and Judaism, we've already gone over to the Judaism, Yahweh and Elohim. Um, African religions is a whole list of names. And African religions, depending on where you're at in Africa, Kinda, uh, Kenya, Uganda, Cote de Verde, Nigeria, you know, and it goes on to Ambulaya, Ambulaya. Akole, Adjuru, Asafar, or Afuser, Akamba, Akan, Alu, you know, you can come here and read these if you want. Hinduism. The Hindu literature mentions that there are 330 million divas and 660 million asuras. There are sects of Hindu who worship a particular div deity for several generations. Thus, to that sect, the name of their god could come from any one of those 330 million. <laughs> Some sects of Hinduism also identify a supreme godhead and use multiple names to refer to this personality. Within Hinduism, there are a number of names of God which are generally in Sanskrit and each supported by a different tradition with the religion Brahma, Indra, uh, Bahagan, uh, Bahagavan, uh, Ishvara, and... Um, Paramatman are among the most commonly used terms for God in the scriptures of Hinduism, but there is an idea about, um, but also it is also literally referred, and I quote, that which is sounded out loudly, but it actually, uh, it means the Lord who is the creator, caretaker, and destroyer of everything, uh, pronounced Aum which is the word used for calling or to symbolize the great God. And uh, 
is uh, there's other names Adi Purush, which means timeless being or primordial Lord, first person, and uh, then back to the Bhagavan or, or Bhagwan, Bhagwan means God or the one who has the six celestial powers, those powers thereby knowledge, wisdom, health, wealth, beauty, stoicism, stoicism, supremacy, and to be eternal. Then there's Brahma, Ishvar, um, goes on now. There's uh, Sasaranama, uh, the Sasaranama, literally a thousand names, is a type of Hindu scripture in which a deity is referred by a thousand or more different names. Um, Sikhism, the Sikhus, uh, um, there are multiple names for God in Sikhism. Some of the popular names of God in Sikhism are Vaheguru, meaning wonderful teacher, bringing light, remove darkness. His name is considered the greatest among the Sikhs, or the Sikhs. And it is known as Gurvantar, the Guru's word. What Guru is the only way to meet God in Sikhism. Uh, uh, there's Ink Ankar, uh, Satnam, meaning true name. Some are of the opinion that this is the name for God in itself. Others believe that this is an adjective used to describe Gurmantar or Reguhu. Um, you know, you check out some of this stuff. Zoroasterism. The Ahura Mazda, Lord Wisdom, is the name of the Supreme Being, Benevolent God in Zoroasterism. Zoroasterism. Um... And several, you know, goes on to talk about several taboos of gods and stuff. But I think we pretty much covered them. <laughs> you can, like I said, you can look it up, Names of God, on Wiki if you want to come to this page and check it out. We're going to close that out. And we're going to close out the names of the god in Judaism. And we're going to actually go to Yeshua for our next section. I'm going to pause here for just a second. Alright folks, sorry for the interruption there. I'm back. Of course it wasn't much of an interruption for you. <laughs> or at least it didn't last very long, huh? I had to get a fresh cup of coffee and uh, answer a text message. And uh, we'll continue on here. The uh, name Yeshua, for other persons named Yeshua, other claim transcriptions of Jesus, see Yeshua disambiguation. Um, for the person teaching the acts of Jesus Christ, see Jesus and historical Jesus. For the Hebrew proper name, see Yeshu, and see also Jesus in the Talmud. Now, Yeshua, the vowel pointing, a Yeshua, a Yeshua, uh, in Hebrew, was common alternative form of the name Yehoshua, or Joshua in later books of the Hebrew Bible and among Jews of the Second Temple period. The name corresponds to the Greek spelling Leosis or Lesus, from which comes the English spelling Jesus. Okay. The Hebrew spelling Yeshua appears in some later books of the Hebrew Bible, once for Joshua the son of Nun, and twenty eight times for Joshua the high priest. Excuse me, my goodness. And KJV, Jeshua, and other priests called Jeshua. Although these same priests are also given the spelling Joshua in 11 further instances in the books of Haggai and Zechariah. It differs from the usual Hebrew uh, Bible spelling of Joshua. Uh, Yehoshua. And with a with no uh, which is the Y abbreviated with H O S H U A, found 218 times in the Hebrew Bible. In the absence of the consonant H, in the placement of the semi vowel Vav, after not before the consonant Shin, it also differs from the Hebrew spelling Yeshu which is found in Ben Yehuda's dictionary and used in most secular contexts in modern Israeli Hebrew historical texts to refer to other Joshua's recorded in Greek texts such as Jesus ben Ananias and Jesus ben Sirah.
Oh, man. I love these little Honduran cigars too much. I really do. Anyway. In English, <laughs> the name Yeshua is extensively used by followers of the Messianic Judaism as well as other Christian denominations who wish to use what they consider to be Jesus, Hebrew, or Aramaic name. The etymology. Now, the Greek transliteration, and I'm over here on the side, Leos, Lesuus, or Jesus, Jesus, can stand for both classical biblical Hebrew Yehoshua, um, which is Yehoshua, or uh, the two, the late biblical Hebrew Yeshua. Jeshua. Uh, Bottom. Uh, this later form developed the, the Hebrew, not Aramaic. All three spellings variants occur in the Hebrew Bible, including when referring to the same person. During the Second Temple period, Jews of Galilee uh, tended to preserve the traditional spelling, keeping the uh, such and such letter there for the O in the first syllable and even adding an additional letter to the U in the second syllable. However, Jews of Jerusalem tended to spell the name as they pronounced it, Jeshua or Jeshua, uh, contracting the spelling to and it'll show a Hebrew spelling there without the O letter. Later, Aramaic references to the Hebrew Bible adopted and contracted phonetic form of this Hebrew name as an Aramaic name. Yeshua in Hebrew is verbal derivative from to rescue or to deliver. <coughs> its usage among the Jews of the Second Temple period and the biblical Aramaic Hebrew name Yeshua was common. The uh, Hebrew Bible mentions several individuals with this name, while also using their full name, Joshua. This name is a feature of biblical books written in the post-exilic period, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Chronicles, and was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, though Haggai uh, and Zechariah prefer the spelling Joshua. Strong's Concordance connects the name uh, Yeshua in English form uh, Jeshua as used in multiple instances in Ezra, Nehemiah, and one in First Chron one and Second Chronicles with the verb to deliver or to rescue. It is often translated as he saves to conform with Matthew one twenty one. She will bear a son, and I quote here, she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save the people from his sins and that's in the NASB um, actually the KJB um, S is in, it's actually well if you read it in Isaiah it says she will bear a son and his name shall be Emmanuel which means God is, is um, amongst us or God is with us um, the name Yeshua transliterated in the English Old Testament as Jeshua is a late form of the biblical Hebrew name Yehoshua or Joshua and spelled with a wa in the second syllable um, the late biblical Hebrew spellings for earlier names often contracted the theor theophoric element Yeho to Yo uh, thus Yehokanan contracted to Yochanan. However, there is no name aside from Yehoshua, which in which Yeho became Yi. The name occurs in the Hebrew of the Old Testament at verses Ezra and in Nehemiah and in Chronicles. I'm not going to read all the verses there, but in Second Chronicles, also in the Aramaic as at Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, Nehemiah. Um, this name refers to Joshua, son of Nun, the successor of Moses as leader of the Israelites. Note that in earlier English, where adaptations of the names of biblical figures were generally based on Latin Vulgate forms, Yeshua was generally transcribed identically to e Jesus in e English. 
So I wasn't completely wrong in my and I thought it was from the Vulgate, but then some people but see it goes through the Greek and then to the Vulgate and then to what we know as modern English, just like it says here. Generally transcribed identically to Jesus in English. It was only when the Protestant Bible translators of circa 1600s went back to the original languages that the distinction between Jesus and, and Yeshua appeared in English. The name Yehoshua uh, has the form of a compound Yeho and Shua. Yeho is another form of Yahoo. Uh, a theophoric element standing for the name of God, the Tetragrammaton, Yahweh, some way, sometimes uh, transcribed into English as Yahweh or Jehovah. And Shua is a noun meaning a cry for help, a saving cry, that is to say a shout given when in need of rescue. Together the name would then literally mean God is a saving cry, that is to say shout to God when in need of help. Okay, turn to God when in need of help. Don't turn to the devil. No, 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 no. Don't do that. Don't do that. Dial in nine one one crap. <laughs> That's a nine. Skipping the ten, going to the eleven. You're skipping over God. That's what it means. But never mind that. I I digress. The name. <laughs> uh, another explanation for the name of Yahushua is that it comes from the root Yad Shin Anin or Ayin meaning to deliver, save, or rescue. According to the book of Numbers, verse thirteen sixteen, the name of Joshua, son of Nun, was originally Hosea or Hoshea, and the name Yehoshua is usually spelled the same, but with a Yod a Yod and it added at the beginning Hoshea certainly comes from the root Yahshua, Yod Shin Ayin, and in Hephil form the Yod becomes a Wa, and not from the word uh, Shua, Jewish encyclopedia, although ultimately both roots appear to be related. See how technically difficult all this language is? It's crazy, isn't it? In the first century, Philo of Alexandria, in a Greek exposition, offered his understanding of Moses' reason for the name change of the biblical hero, Jehoshua, Joshua son of Nun, from Hosea, similar to Hosea meaning he rescued, to Jehoshua in commemoration of his salvation, or commemoration of his salvation, and uh, Eunuch, Ewak, refers to salvation of the Lord. Inuak or Lysius meaning being the Greek form of the name Inuak Eo Enopia Kipio. Uh, I probably got that wrong, but anyway, on the change of names. Um, similarly the subjugant renders Ben Sira as saying in Greek form of the name Inunoak son the son of Neu uh, Yehoshua bin Nun, who according to his name became great unto the salvation and deliverance of his chosen ones. And it says a whole bunch of stuff here in Greek that I'm not going to attempt to read. And it says, however, Ben Sira originally wrote in Hebrew in the second century BC, and the only extant Hebrew manuscript for his this passage has in his days, not according to his name which would be in Hebrew, and thus does not comment on the name Yehoshua as connoting uh, deliverance, um, connoting deliverance. Uh, Yehoshua ben Nun, who was formed to be in his days of great deliverer of his chosen ones, uh, possibly the translators understood the phrase was formed in his days to refer to being transformed by his name change and thus has according to his name as a paraphrase, paraphrasic or phrastic translation or else they were working from a different text. <laughs> the distinction between the longer Yehoshua and the shorter Yeshua form does not exist in Greek. 
And so we go on to archaeological evidence, uh, the Talians lexicon of the Second Temple period, names on inscriptions in Palestine, 2002, includes for Joshua, 85 examples of Hebrew Yeshua, 15 of Yehoshua, and 48 examples of Lysaus in Greek inscriptions, with only one Greek variant as Yeshua. Um, one ossuary of the round 20 known with the name Yeshua Ramah, Rahmani, number 9, discovered by Ezra Sikonik in 1931, has Yeshua, uh, Yeshua bin Yosef. The Yeshua may have been scratched out. The Jewish magical incantation vows have been discovered both bearing variant spellings of Yeshua. Apart from the Yesh in Yeshua ben Yosef Asuri, the only other known evidence for the existence of a Yeshu of form prior to the material related to Jesus in the Talmud is Graffito, which Joachim Jeremias identified in Bethesda in 1966, but which now is filled in. goes on with some pronunciation uh, talks about the vowels and, and I'm going to skip all over all that because uh, the you know we'll kind of skip through it but it says Yeshua or Jeshua uh, talks about the vowels goes on to talk about the Seagull and the Yeshua the final letter Ayin a uh, rough guttural sound not found in Greek or English, sometimes transcribed. Um, the final represents the Patak Genova, uh, the furtive Patak, indicating the consonant Ion is pronounced after a vowel, and the word stressed is moved to the middle syllable. This is all in talking, see? So, in the Hebrew name of the historical Jesus is probably pronounced Yeshua. Although it is uncertain and depends on the reconstruction of several ancient Hebrew dialects, uh, Tausir suggests even though Galileans tended to keep the traditional spelling for Yehoshua with the letter Vav for Elo uh, for Yol, they still pronounce the name similarly to the Judeans as Yeshua, who tended to spell the name phonetically as pronounced, redu reducing the name thus, and with the uh, Seminations thereof. Uh, the Qumran describes the general linguistic environment of the Hebrew dialects by the time the dead, of the Dead Sea Scrolls. The articulation of the H, along with other guttural phenomes, or phenomes uh, as well as the approximants, weakened significantly. Thus, the Hebrew pronunciations became less stable. Um, when the two successive vowels were no longer separated by a consonant. The speakers optionally either reduced the two vowels to a single vowel or op oppositely expanded them to emphasize each vowel separately, sometimes formative, uh, forming a furtive glide in between. For example, the Dead Sea Scrolls spell the Hebrew word, and they show a spelling there, seen, variously recorded both pronunciations, reduced and expanded. The Hebrew name Yehoshua generally reduced to Yeshua, but an expanded Yehoshua is possible, especially in Galilee, whose traditional orth orthography um, possibly reflects this. The original name for Jesus. The English name Jesus derives from the late Latin name Lesus, which transliterates the canon Greek name Lesus. The subjugant and, and, okay, at this point I'm going to stop right here because this is part of the name game, okay? Everybody's talking about G. Zeus, okay? And they're trying to relate, oh, well, uh, they were they, they replaced his name with the name of Zeus secretly, you know, and they're tricking you, okay? Again, refer to what I said in the first part of this series, okay? You can't trick God. You can't put him in a box, okay? I don't matter. I don't care if you call him Fred, quite frankly. If you want to call God Fred, and God knows that that's who you're talking to, then that then that's cool, okay? 
because he's not reading your lips. He doesn't care what's coming out of your mouth. He cares what's inside of your heart and your emotions and your intentions because that is where the energy is formed. The, the words are tricks, the words are spells, and that's all they are, okay, to trick the mind. The energy is created inside you, and that's what any of this stuff boils down to. So, with that being said, this right here, the original name for Jesus, the English name Jesus, derives from the late Latin name Lesus, which translate, literates from the Canoe Greek name Lesaus or Lesus, which is spelled differently, but it's basically pronounced the same way. And uh, it's not Zeus. has nothing to do with freaking Zeus, people. Okay, so you can quit that stupid crap. That's all, really one of the whole reasons I've started making this video, this whole video series, is that is the name game. People trying to say, oh, it's a trick of phonetics and a trick of the words, and they've replaced his name with this and that and another thing. Okay, there's a history behind this stuff. And, and the history is, is quite open and quite obvious, and it gets quite detailed in all the different languages and different translations thereof. And they, they didn't replace his name with Zeus. It has nothing to do with Zeus. Okay? In the subjugant, uh, and other Greek language Jewish texts, such as the writings of Josephus and Philo of Exil Ex Alexandria, Lysus is a standard Kony Greek form used to translate both of the Hebrew names, Yehoshua and Yeshua. Greek Lysus is also used to represent the name of Joshua, son of Nun. In the New Testament passages, Acts 7.45 and Hebrews 4.8, it was even used in the subjugant to translate the name Hosea or Hosea in one of the three verses where this referred to Joshua, the son of Nun, in Deuteronomy 32.44. During the Second Temple period, beginning 538 B.C. to 70 A.D., Yeshua became a known form of the name Yehoshua. All occurrences of Yeshua in the Hebrew Bible are in, and it goes on to talk, Chronicles, Second Chronicles, Ezra, and Nehemiah, where it is transliterated into English as Jeshua. Okay, uh, and yeah, there's a that's where you get a Jesuit connection there, but we're not going to go there right now. We're not talking about that. <laughs> Two of these men, Joshua and the son of Nun, and Joshua the high priest, are mentioned in other books of the Hebrew Bible, where they are instead called Yehoshua, transliterated into English as Joshua. The earlier form, Yehoshua, did not appear, however, and remained in use as well in the post-exilic books. Joshua the son of Nun is called both Yeshua ben Nun and Nehemiah, and Yehoshua in Chronicles. The short form of Yeshua was used for Jesus ben Sirach in Hebrew fragments of the wisdom of Sirach. Some concern remains over whether these fragments faithfully represent the original Hebrew text or instead a later, later translation back into Hebrew. The earlier form of Yehoshua saw revived usage from the Hasmonean period onwards. Although the name Yeshua is still found in letters from the time of Bar Kova revolt, and uh, that's 135 to one, uh, I mean 132 to 135 A.D. In the documentary *Nentary: uh, Lost Tomb of Jesus*, archaeologist Amos Cloner stated that the name Yeshua was then a popular form of the name Yehoshua, and was one of the common names in the time of the Second Temple. In discussing whether it was remarkable to find a tomb with the name of Jesus, the particular ossuary in question bears the inscription, Yehunda bar Yeshua. He pointed out that the same name, or that that name, had been found 71 times in burial caves from that time period. Thus, both the full form Yehoshua and the abbreviated form Yeshua were in use during the Gospel period.
and in relation to the same person, as in the Hebrew Bible, references to Yehoshua, Yeshua, son of Nun, and Yehoshua, Yeshua, the high priest in the days of Ezra, Clement of Alexandria, and St. Creel of Jerusalem considered the Greek form Lesaus or Lesus to be the original, even going so far as to interpret it as a true Greek name and not simply a transliteration of Hebrew. Similar situation has been seen in the use of the true Greek name Simon as a translation of the Hebrew name Shimon in texts such as the Sirach. The Eusebius related it to the Greek root meaning to heal, thus making it a variant of Jason meaning healer. However, the New Testament describes Jesus as being a part of a Jewish milieu, reading the Hebrew Bible and debating with the Pharisees over interpretations of the Jewish legal tradition. The Gospels record several Hebrew and Aramaic words or expressions spoken by him. Moreover, Eusebius uh, reports that Jesus' student, Matthew, wrote a gospel in the Hebrew language. Note scholars typically argue the word Hebrew in the test New Testament refers to Aramaic. An argument in favor of the Hebrew reduced form Yeshua as opposed to Yehoshua is, old Syri the, is the Old Syriac Bible, uh, 200 AD, and the Peshitta, Reserve, preserve this same spelling but using the equivalent Aramaic letters. Yeshu. Syriac does not use a furtive pathetic, uh, so extra A is not used, is still the pronunciation used in the West Syriac, Syriac dialect, whereas East Syriac has rendered the pronunciation of these same letters as uh, Isolo. Mm, excuse me, and uh, these texts were translated from the Greek, but the name is not a simple transliteration of the Greek form because Greek did not have a sh sound and substituted s, and likewise lacked and therefore omitted the final aeon sound, and um, it can be argued that the Aramaic speakers who used this name had a continual connection to the Aramaic speakers in communities founded by the apostles and other students of Jesus, thus independently preserved his historical name. Alternative, alternatively, Tauscher uh, in 1998 suggests that Aramaic references to the Bible, Hebrew Bible, had long used Yeshua for Hebrew names such as Yehoshua ben Nun. So the possibility of Jesus having been Yehoshua remains. The uh, Syriac, the Aramaic of the Pinchetta, does not distinguish between Joshua and Jesus. The lexicon of William Jennings gives the same form, Yesu, for both names. The Hebrew final letter Ayin is equivalent to the final in Syriac. So in other words, in, if you want to speak in Aramaic, Aramaic, which is actually what Jesus spoke in most of the time when he was walking this planet, and uh, it would be Yesu, would be the most properest name for Jesus. Now Yeshua, and Yeshua would be the Hebrew, Yehoshua is another brand of Hebrew, and then Yeshu, or Yeshu, in the Talmud. In the Talmud, the only one reference is made to the spelling of Yeshua in verbatim quotation from the Hebrew Bible regarding Jeshua, son of Josedek, uh, elsewhere called Joshua, son of Josedek. And the Talmud does refer to several people named Yehoshua from before, Joshua ben Periak, or Peri, Peri, Perakia, uh, and after Jesus, Joshua ben Hananiah. And however, in references to Jesus in Talmud, where the name occurs, it is rendered Yeshu, which is name reserved in Aramaic and Hebrew literature from the early medieval period until today, solely for Jesus of Nazareth, not for other Joshua's. However, some scholars, such as Mayer, 1978 regarded the two named Yeshu texts in the Talmud, the Sanhedrin 48 to 107, 
uh, to be later amendments and not original. Rabbinical commentary on the difference Yeshu and Yeshua. Yeshua was named or used as a name for Jesus in the late additions to the Yosepian. However, it is usage here is a translation back into the Hebrew Yeshua from the Greek. In general, rabbinical sources use Yeshu. And this is a form in which some name references to Jesus in the Talmud as Yeshu occur in some manuscripts of the Babylonian Talmud. Though some scholars, such as Mayer, again, 1978, have argued that the presence of the name Yeshu in these texts is a late interpolation. Now, other Hebrew sources referencing Yeshu included the Toledot Yeshu, Sefer Nister Hakamor, or Jacob ben Rubens, Milhamath Hashim Yesefer Nezahom Yashin Sefer Joseph. A king, and the works of Ivan Shifferet, Moses Hakodian de Tordesilias, and Erdasilias. The same difference, I guess. Hasidai, Hasdai, Kreskas, etc. The name Yeshu is unknown in archaeological sources and inscriptions, except for one ossuary found in Palestine, which has an inscription where someone has started to write first Yeshu incorrectly, question mark, and then written Yeshua bar Yosef beneath it, or Yehosef. And there are 24 other ossuaries to the various Yeshuas and Yehoshuas. None of the others have Yeshu. All other Joshuas in the Talmud, rabbinical writings, modern Hebrew, are always Yeshua or Yehoshua. There are no undisputed examples of any Aramaic or Hebrew text where Yeshu refers to anyone else other than Jesus. Some of the rabbinical sources comment on the reasons for the missing Ayan from Yeshu as opposed to the Hebrew Bible Yeshu and uh, or Yeshua and Yeshua Leon Modina argues that it was Jesus himself who made his disciples remove the Ayan and that therefore they cannot now restore it. A tradition states that the shortening to Yeshu relates to the Y-S-H-U of the Yamak Shemo may his name be obliterated again we go back to the superstition about saying the Lord's name in vain against this David Flusser suggests that the name Yeshu itself was in no way abusive but almost certainly a Galilean dialect form of Yeshua now how Yeshua became Jesus. The first letter in the name Yeshua, Jesus, is the Yod. Yod represents the Y sound in Hebrew. Many times, uh, or many names in the Bible that begin with Yod are mispronounced by English speakers, the speakers <laughs> because the Yod is in these uh, names was transliterated in English Bibles with the letter J rather than Y. This came about because the early English letter uh, J was pronounced the way we pronounce Y today. All proper names in the Old Testament were transliterated into English according to their Hebrew pronunciation. But when English pronunciation shifted to what we know today, these transliterations were not altered. Thus, such Hebrew place names as Yerushalayim or Jericho or Yarden have become known as Jerusalem, as Jericho, and Jordan. The Hebrew personal names such as Yona, Yashai, and Yeshu, or Yeshua, have become known as Jonah, Jesse, and Jesus. Now, so you take that and you take away the E. I mean, you take away the J, basically. Make the J silent because it's a modern edition. And you get back to what I was talking about just a minute ago with his true name in the Aramaic, which is Jesus. Right or Isu. Okay, so 
Jesus is actually not Jesus in as as we pronounce it today in our modern English. It is a, just a American English spelling for Yesu. Okay? Just take away the J and the S at the end and you have Isu. The same as Yesu. Okay? And that is the name. And the true name. Preserved through the Aramaic. We just spell it all screwed up. And again, this goes to prove my point that it has nothing to do with Zeus. Okay? Because that really bugs the heck out of me. <laughs> it really does. And uh, Yod is the smallest letter of the alphabet, which is why Yeshua used it in his famous saying in Matthew 5.18. And I quote, Until heaven and earth pass away, not one Yod, one iota in the Greek text, or one kots will pass from the Torah, or from the Word. Um, for emphasis, Yeshua incorporated in this saying a well-known Hebrew expression, lo yod ve lo, or katsotho shel yod. Uh, not a yod, and not a thorn of a yod. So, not the most insignificant and imp unimportant thing, when Yeshua declared that heaven and earth might sooner disappear than the smallest letter of the Hebrew alphabet or the smallest stroke of a letter, he was simply saying that the Torah or law or teaching of Moses would never cease to be. And of course, in our English translations, it's, it's just called the Word. Uh, and, and more precise. You know, the earth and, and, and the earth and heavens will pass away, but his, the Lord's Word will not. And since it all started with the word, and going back to what I compared to in uh, part two about uh, the man behind the keyboard <laughs> and the code, and it gets back down. And when you think of code, you wait down code. What is code? Code is mathematics. Everything we know today that we've created is created with mathematics. As above, so below. Well, so is the, everything else we know as reality is created with mathematics. Quantum physics has proved this. And um, it is the base of our reality as we know it or as we sense it. Because again, what we're sensing are just impulses, electronic impulses that we're interpreting the way that our, our functions have been uh, programmed to interpret them. <clears throat> um, okay, but I'm getting off topic here with the name thing. Now let's get back to the name thing. Let's try to stick to the name thing here. It is hard. Believe me, it's hard. So, but anyway, the second sound in Yeshua's name is called Sisere. Um, this is pronounced almost like the letter E in the word net. Um, it's just as the Y sound of the first letter is mispronounced in today's English. So, to the first vowel in Jesus. Before the Hebrew name Yeshua was transliterated into English, it was the first transliterated into Greek. And there was no difficulty in transliterating the R sound, or the Sere sound. Um, since the ancient Greek language had an equivalent letter which represented the sound. And there was no real difficulty in transcribing this same first vowel into English. The translators of the earliest versions of the English Bible transliterated the Sere in Yeshua uh, with an E. Unfortunately, later, English speakers guessed wrongly that this E should be pronounced as in me. And uh, thus, the first syllable of the English version of Yeshua came to be pronounced G instead of Ye. And so that's where you get your Jesus um, or Yesu, uh, E, Ye. That's the Hebrew. Now, uh, it is this pronunciation which produced the euphemistic profanities such as G and G's. Okay, what was I talking about a minute ago? <laughs> exactly. So, and, and, no, I haven't read this article before. This is the first 
time I've read it. It's when I, it, all this stuff I'm reading myself for the first time as well. I didn't. I, I found this stuff, and as I do everything in my life, uh, I go off of instinctual what the Lord shows me right off the bat. And when I say the Lord, I'm talking about the Creator, the power of the Creator within me. And uh, He guides me into all this stuff. I, 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 don't, I don't sit here and make up my mind to do this on my own. <laughs> I really don't. <laughs> Believe it or not. Um, I, would, I could just as well be playing Xbox right now, to tell you the truth. You know, if it wasn't for... Anyway. Some of us have to do what we have to do. And uh, that's all there is to it. I don't expect you to understand that. So, uh, since Yeshua was spelled as Yeshua and not Jesus in most English versions of the Old Testament, for example, Ezra 2.2 and Chronicles, 2 Chronicles 31.15, one easily gets the impression that the name is never mentioned in the Hebrew Scriptures. Yet, Yeshua appears there 29 times, and is the name of at least five different persons and one village in the southern part of Ye Yehuda or Judah. Um, and we just read some of that. That's what we were talking about in this last transliteration of an explanation of Yeshua in the definitions on Wikipedia there that was talking about all these different people under the same name. Okay. And uh, so in contrast to the early biblical period, there were relatively few different names used in use among the Jewish population of the land of Israel at the time of the Second Temple. The name Yeshua was one of the most common male names in that period. And of course, Yeshua at this time was basically Joshua, what we know Joshua. Uh, it was tied in with El Eliezer for the fifth place behind Simon, Joseph, Judith, and John. Nearly one out of ten persons known from the period of the time period was named Yeshua. Uh, or Yeshua. Okay, Yeshua. Um, in proper English spelling, it would be Yeshua with an A, as we would, if you wanted to spell it phonetically. The first sound of the second syllable of Yeshua is the sh sound, and is represented by the Hebrew letter Shin. However, Greek, like many other languages, has no ish sound, or sh sound. Instead, the closest approximation, the Greek sigma, was used when transcribing Yeshua as Lysus, or Isus. Translators of the English versions of the New Testament transliterated the Greek transcription of the Hebrew name instead of returning to the original Hebrew. This was doubly unfortunate, first because the sh sound exists in English, and the second because in English the S sound can be shifted to the Z sound, which is what happened in the case of the pronunciation of Jesus. And of course in Spanish, Jesus is, is not even pronounced Jesus. It's pronounced Jesus. Right? <laughs> hey, Zeus. Hey, what are you doing, Zeus? Yeah, I know. I knew you was going to go there and say that. Uh -huh. I've heard it all before. The fourth sound one hears in the name Yeshua, or Yeshua, is the U sound, as the word true. Like the first three sounds, this also has come to be mispronounced, but in this case, it is not the fault of the translators. They transcribe this sound accurately, but in English it is not a phonetic language. Ah, really? English is not a phonetic language? And U can be pronounced in more than one way. At some point, the U in Jesus, in Jesus, came to pronounce as in cut. So the way we say G is us. Uh, again, like a transliterated or I mean trans uh, mispronounced A. The uh U turned into uh. The A sound as in the word father ah uh, father is the fifth sound in Jesus' name. It is followed by a guttural pronounced by contracting the lower throat muscles and retracting the tongue root, an unfamiliar task for English speakers.
It, it, in an exception to the rule, the vowel sound A associated with the last letter AN, the gutter roll is pronounced before, not after. While there is no equivalent in English or any other Indo-European language, it is somewhat similar to the last sound in the name of the composer Bach. In this position, it is almost inaudible to the Western ear. Some Israelis pronounce this last sound and some don't, depending on what part of the dispersion of their families return from. The Hebrew Language Academy, uh, guardian of the Guardian of the purity of the language has ruled that it should be sounded. The Israeli radio and television announcers are required to pronounce it correctly. There was no letter to represent them, so these fifth and sixth sounds were dropped from the Greek transcription of Yeshua. The transcription from which English Jesus is derived. So where did the final S of Jesus come from? Masculine names in Greek ordinarily end up with a consonant, usually with an S sound, and less frequently with an N or R sound. In the case of Lesu, or Isu, the Greeks added the sigma, a sigma, the S sound, to the close the word. The name is true for the name Nicodemus, Judas, Lazarus, and others. English speakers make one further change from the original pronunciation of Jesus' name. English places an accent on G rather than Seuss. For this reason, the U has shortened in its English pronunciation to a. Uh. Or uh. <laughs> um, in the West, a child's name is often chosen for its pleasant sound or because another family member had it. The Jews of the second period, temple period, also named after relatives uh, in Luke 1, 59-63. However, almost all Jewish names have a literal meaning. Occasionally this is seen in English names too, such as Scott, a person from Scotland, Johnson, son of John, the baker, the bread maker. Um, and with Hebrew names, it is the rule rather than the exception. The name Yeshua literally means the Lord's salvation or salvation from the Lord. In comparison, prior to being transliterated from the Hebrew Bible, the name Yesu did not exist in Greek. And through multiple translations and changes in pronunciation, a tradition of saying Jesus has obscured his name, Yeshua, uh, and has shifted his perceived message and identity from Hebrew to Greek. <clears throat> and with that we're gonna we go one we'll actually continue a little bit more on Jesus in the next section we'll make a section of uh, number four uh, to finish out this to a degree let me see I'll have to mark that um, to get into some of the Catholicism, um, Jesus in uh, Wikipedia and uh, a few other things here in reference to it. I think part four will probably be rounding this up and finish it off. Again, I'll show you this name, uh, this Hebrew site, uh, to learn Hebrew and pronunciations thereof. If you want to actually hear it, or somebody else say it, uh, the way it's supposed to be pronounced. You go to this site, it's Hebrew, www, Hebrew with a number four, Christians.com, slash names of God, and of course God isn't spelled out because it's Hebrew, <laughs> and uh, slash Yeshua, slash Yeshua with a small y, HTML. Um, you can freeze frame this here, copy this down, go to this, he, I mean, there's more to this site than this. There's home, grammar, blessings, prayers, all kinds of stuff. But the names of God part, even if you just went to HebrewForChristians.com, okay, and then you can find the link on the side that says names of God. And uh, the Son of God is revealed in the Brit Chadasha. And uh, you can go down here, you let it load up, and it's an Adonai, gives you the English spelling, gives you the Greek, I mean, the... Uh, 
the Hebrew spelling. It's got a little speaker down here below it. And you can press the speakers for each one of these words and hear it pronounced. You can also see it written in its pronunciation right here. Um, and what it means, Adonai, meaning I am. Um, you know, and it goes on, Advocate, Intercessor, All in All, Alpha and Omega, Anointed One, Beginning of Creation of God, Beloved One, Bread of Heaven, Bread of God, Bridegroom, Cornerstone, Christ, Day Spring from on High, uh, Christ would be what we know as Hamashiach, okay, so when you hear somebody say Yeshua Hamashiach, it means Yeshua, meaning Jesus, or Joseph, or Jesus, the Christ. That's what Hamashiach means, Christ. The Messiah, the Anointed One. So that when somebody says that, uh, I've been known to say it in, in that terminology my, myself. And... Um, Faithful witness, the last Adam, first and last, God, God bless you forever. It actually goes, this is a pretty long page, Good Shepherd. Gives you lots of words and you can listen to their actual original Hebrew. And it says, here's he, Jesus, and the Hebrew writing, and then Yeshua. And it says, Yeshua, Yeshua, Jesus, Matthew. Note the name Jesus appears 973 times in the Brit Chadasha. Okay, and then Jesus Christ, Hamashiach Yeshua. And you can learn how to spell it too if you don't already know. I know a lot of people spell it different ways because our English language is so twisted. We just, you know, we can mess it up all the time. Kind of like I like to do with Pythagoras. I mean, Pythagoras. <laughs> and with that, thank you for joining me once again. And blessings to you all.